cardiac valvular disorders. Now we know that valves are actually flaps that are located on each end of both ventricles and they act when properly healthy and normal they will act as one way inlet and one way outlet. We have four cardiac valves mitral valve, tricuspid, aortic and pulmonary valve. So the mitral valve is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. The tricuspid is located between the right atrium and the right ventricle. The aortic valve separates the aorta from the left ventricle and the pulmonary valve separates the uh, right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk. So that is uh, some basic knowledge. Now let's see what sort of valvular disorders we can have. Firstly, we can have stenosis. Stenosis simply means that the valvular diameter will decrease causing it to become very narrow and it will be very hard uh, to pump blood through it. And secondly, we can have insufficiency or regurgitation of the blood. So in this case, we'll have a uh, insufficient valve which will cause the blood to go in the backward direction uh, and not forward as it is intended to. Now we know that the heart produces normal heart sounds S1 and S2 that can be heard on auscultation. We'll discuss them in detail uh, after we've discussed each of these valvular disorders in detail. So it will be easy for you to remember all of them together. So I will not talk about the normal heart sounds and the pathologic uh, heart sounds while I'm discussing each of these topics but in the end we'll have a collective uh, session to see which heart sounds occur in which valvular disease. So just as an overview, murmurs are abnormal heart sounds which are produced when blood flows turbulently through a diseased valve. While thrills, uh, now murmurs are heard on auscultation. While thrills are caused by severe lesions that can even be externally palpated. Now with that aside, let's discuss the first cause of valvular disease. First of all, we have acute rheumatic fever. Now, we know that group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infections, they usually occur in children, okay? But what happens is that two to three weeks after a strep throat infection, a pharyngitis, what happens is that the body causes a hypersensitivity reaction against the M protein of the bacteria. So, this usually occurs in 3% of the genetically susceptible individuals due to a process called molecular mimicry. So, the immune system is going to confuse uh, normal body proteins as being the M proteins of the bacteria, this bacteria. So there will be a hypersensitivity reaction, there will be antibodies produced against this M protein which will cross react with myocardial and valvular proteins and cause an inflammatory response. And one thing to remember is that streptococci are totally absent from these lesions since it is a, hyper, um, since it is a hypersensitivity reaction. So this inflammatory response is going to cause deforming fibrotic lesions due to healing and scarring of the valves. So this is one reason why valves can undergo deformity. Now in order to diagnose a person with acute rheumatic fever, we'll base the diagnosis on two points. First of all, we need to have a serologic evidence of a previous streptococcal infection, right? And secondly, we need to have two or more of the Jones criteria. Now what is the Jones criteria? It is also known as the major cri criteria. So here J stands for joint problems, O stands for uh, a heart. I don't know why they converted O into a heart but never mind. So uh, st this heart stands for pancarditis that is the whole of the heart will be inflamed. N will be nodules on the skin which are subcutaneous. E is for erythematous rash. And S is for Sindenham's chorea, which is a neurologic disorder. It is characterized by involuntary, purposeless and rapid movements. It is also known as St. Vitus dance. So these are all the major criteria along which um, a person can be diagnosed with acute rheumatic fever. So we need to have one serologic evidence of a previous strep infection. And secondly, we need to have two or more of these. Okay, this is the major criteria. Now, uh, let's see pancarditis in a bit detail. Since it is a pancarditis, that means the whole of the heart is inflamed. The endocardium, myocardium and pericardium, all three of them are going to be inflamed. So, uh, in the endocarditis, we're going to see small vegetations along the line of closure of uh, valves. Okay, And mitral valve is the most commonly affected valve. Secondly, in the myocardium, the muscular portion of the heart, we are going to find ash of 
antibodies. Now, remember this, this point is very important. It is pathognomic for rheumatic fever. It is actually a histological feature, which is a, actually a collection of lymphocytes, plasma cells and activated macrophages along with fibrinoid necrosis. So this is something you need to remember. Keep this in mind that Ashoff bodies, if you see them in the myocardium, that are pathognomic for rheumatic fever. Okay. And one more thing is that uh, the activated macrophages in this sort of inflammation uh, in Ashoff bodies are going to be known as Anitzkau cells. I hope I pronounced it right. And these are caterpillar cells because the nucleus is sort of condensed into a spiral shaped thing like a caterpillar. And this will occur in acute rheumatic fever. In chronic rheumatic fever, we do not see these Ashoff bodies. That's a point to remember as well. So the third layer, the pericardium, when it is infected and it undergoes inflammation, we're going to have friction rub and chest pain. Friction rub means uh, it is a sound that is heard when both the layers of the pericardium rub against each other. And chest pain, because it is pericardium, it is innervated, it is going to cause chest pain. Uh, now, we also have a minor criteria to diagnose acute rheumatic fever. And the first one is uh, fever. It comes by no surprise because it is already in the name. Okay, uh, Arthralgias, arthralgias and EKG changes. Uh, in EKG, normally we have a first degree heart block. That is, PR interval will be increased. That is because uh, if there is a block between conduction in the AV node uh, and... Uh, signals from the atria to cannot flow into the ventricles then that is called a first degree heart block and PR interval in this case is raised and lastly the liver will increase the production of acute phase reactants so uh, this is a very important slide you need to remember this major criteria the minor criteria and um, all of these Now regarding the treatment of acute rheumatic fever, we need to have surgical repair or replacement of the diseased valve and uh, there can also be mitral valvuloplasty. This procedure simply means that uh, you surgically put a catheter into the mitral valve and by using a ballooning mechanism open up the uh, mitral valve. Okay, So that would be the treatment if the mitral valve is affected during the acute rheumatic fever. After an acute attack of acute rheumatic fever, uh, patients are susceptible to reactivation and becoming chronic rheumatic fever. This is actually not evident because it is a slow process and not that evident. The symptoms are not that evident until years or decades after the initial attack. In this uh, case, we are going to have valvular scarring and stenosis just as uh, in the case of acute uh, type. And in this case, the valves will have a fish mouth appearance that is they will be stenosed. In this case, the mitral valve and the aortic valve are the most commonly involved valves. The mitral valve will have scarring and thickening, while the aortic valve's commissures may fuse together like this. These are three cusps, but this might fuse like this, and thus we'll have a, a median raffi sort of thing. Now let's see some aortic valve diseases. We can either have stenosis of this or regurgitation. Firstly, let's see stenosis. Stenosis simply means a narrow orifice so the aortic valve will have a smaller opening the etiologies for aortic stenosis are post inflammatory scarring rhd as we've discussed just now in senile calcific aortic stenosis that is this is actually a degenerative change uh, which occurs uh, degeneration occurs during due to age increasing age and uh, in this case the aortic stenosis will occur because there will be calcification in the uh, valve if the valve is congenitally deformed, that is, let's say it's not normal, it's not tricuspid and it is bicuspid, uh, we know that in the normal tricuspid valve, uh, three cusps equally share the pressure and it is equally distributed among them. But in this case, that is not, uh, that is not possible. So this one is more susceptible to the wear and tear of a normal daily function because we use it all the time. Uh, the people who are alive not the people who are dead inside regarding the complications of uh, aortic stenosis there will be concentric left ventricular hypertrophy because the ventricle is trying so hard to push blood through the stenosed aortic valve so it is going to undergo uh, hypertrophy because it has to increase the pressure and the valve thickness 
the wall thickness is going to increase this is called pressure overload and in this case the sarcomeres are going to be added in parallel when that happens then we have increased uh, thickness of the ventricular wall secondly we can have angina and syncope on exercise why is that because uh, of course the heart cannot uh, pump blood into systemic circulation properly because of the aortic valve stenosis and when we have increased demand such as on exercise the heart will fail and will not be able to supply blood to the coronary arteries as well as to the um, brain and lastly one important thing is the microangiopathic hemolytic anemia now this is a sort of hemolytic anemia that occurs because when the ventricle forces blood out of the narrow stenose aortic valve uh, what happens is that the rbcs can get damaged and convert into schistocytes the treatment for an aortic valve stenosis is valve replacement and this is only possible after the onset of complication because uh, before that the heart will try its best not to fail and uh, do all sorts of compensatory mechanisms. The next aortic valve disease is aortic regurgitation. So in this case there is blood backflow from aorta into the left ventricle during diastole. So why does this occur? We have many etiologies but the basic problem here is that the aortic root, the root of the aorta has dilated for some reason okay and if it has dilated then the uh, cusps of the valve are not going to approximate properly and 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 if they do not approximate they will not close properly and during diastole blood will rush back into the left ventricle so uh, why does this aortic root dilation occur most commonly it is a degenerative process the second cause is syphilitic aneurysm now syphilitic aneurysm is caused during uh, tertiary syphilis in which what happens is that uh, we know that the uh, uh, we know that the arterial wall has three layers tunica intima media and adventitia in the adventitia has vesa visorum that is the blood supply to the big arteries and when there is inflammation in these vesa visorum these spirochetes are going to get stuck here they will cause obliterative end arteritis and due to that the vessel wall will become weak because their supply will be cut off and the weak vessel wall will be prone to aneurysm formation so that is another cause we can have rheumatoid arthritis both of them are inflammatory conditions and may affect the aortic root as well we can also have marfan syndrome which is a connective tissue disorder and uh, that will also cause vessel wall weakening and thus dilation and we can also have intrinsic valvular disease so there will be something intrinsically wrong with the valve uh, that can be due to post inflammatory scarring due to rheumatic heart disease or any disease and also due to infective endocarditis as we've discussed in the previous video now to understand the clinical picture of aortic regurgitation we need to understand something first of all when the left ventricle contracts to pump the blood out into the aorta most of it will go back right because the heart is trying very hard to pump the blood out but what happens is that during diastole all that blood goes back into the ventricle so uh, the systolic blood pressure will be high but the diastolic blood pressure will go down so if this increases and this decreases the pulse pressure which is the difference of these two will increase and if the pulse pressure is increased all the clinical signs are due to the increased pulse pressure so first of all we're going to have a pounding pulse which is called a water hammer pulse secondly we're going to have quinky sign uh, which is a uh, which is when you feel your pulse in your nail beds and lastly we have head bobbing this is actually a sort of rhythmic nodding um, that is in sync with your heartbeat so in this case it shows that the pulse pressure is so high that the patient can feel his or her pulse and that's why there is this rhythmic nodding of the head regarding the complications of this there can be left ventricular dilation because there is volume overload on the left ventricle and for that what happens is that there is eccentric hypertrophy that means that the sarcomeres are added in series and not in parallel so in this ca case as i've mentioned before in previous videos that uh, when sarcomeres are added in series the wall thickness necessarily does not increase it might decrease or remain the same uh, but the left ventricular dilates or hypertrophies in this way so that would be one complication so valve replacement is only an option when there is severe left ventricular dysfunction because uh, that is when the uh, pathology is most evident.
Now let's see some mitral valve diseases. First of all, we'll see mitral valve prolapse. What is mitral valve prolapse? This is actually ballooning of the mitral valve into the left atrium during systole. So what happens is that when the ventricle is contracting, this valve is going to balloon out into the left atrium. Why does this occur? First of all, the first etiology is myxomatous degeneration of the valve. In this sort of uh, degeneration, what happens is that the proteoglycan in the extracellular matrix is increased while the fibrillar collagen and elastin has uh, decreased. So this gives this myxomatous appearance, gelatinous appearance and it is a form of degeneration that will cause ballooning of the mitral valve and we can also uh, have this due to connective tissue disorders such as uh, Marfan syndrome and Lewis Danlos syndromes etc. The clinical features are usually asymptomatic because this is not as much of a problem. While um, complications can occur, rarely um, these can be infective endocarditis, arrhythmias because of the stretching and one important uh, complication is that mitral valve prolapse can then become complicated and convert into mitral valve regurgitation. The treatment is valve replacement. Secondly, we have mitral valve regurgitation. So this was simply ballooning, but in this case, we are going to have reflux of blood into the left atrium during systole. The uh, etiologies are mitral valve prolapse complication, as I said before. Secondly, we can have left ventricular dilation. When the uh, ventricle has been dilated, these flaps will not approximate properly and uh, this will cause regurgitation, infective endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, and papillary muscle rupture. The papillary muscles are present in the ventricles and connected to them are cord tendinae and this is attached to the mitral valve. So um, if they rupture then that will be prone to uh, balloon into the right atrium and cause regurgitation. The clinical features of mitral valve regurgitation will be due to volume overload. This happens because uh, let's see if this is the left atrium and this is the left ventricle this is the mitral valve and it is causing regurg uh, regurgitation into the uh, left atrium. What will happen is that every time the left ventricle tries to pump blood into the aorta, the uh, some, some of the blood will always be pumped into the left atrium. Okay, So that will cause volume overload into the left atrium as well because this also receives blood from the pulmonary veins. So the left atrium will be receiving blood from here as well as from here causing volume overload here. And also, the next time that the left ventricle opens up during diastole, this blood that was previously regurgitated into the left atrium will come back into the left ventricle and thus left atrium and left ventricle will be constantly facing a volume overload. And this eventually will lead to left-sided heart failure. And lastly, we're going to see mitral valve stenosis. Now, mitral valve stenosis is simple. The mitral valve opening will be narrowed. The orifice will be narrowed. The causes can be post-inflammatory scarring due to rheumatic heart disease. The clinical features will be due to volume overload in the left atrium because the atrium is not going to uh, be able to push blood into the ventricle. This will cause left atrial dilation and since the blood is not being able to be pumped uh, forward into the aorta that will back up and go into the pulmonary um, circulation causing pulmonary congestion this will also cause pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary hypertension will then uh, eventually cause right sided heart failure atrial dilation may also cause atrial fibrillation because the conduction fibers will also be stretched because of the dilation and they become irritable and prone to all sorts of arrhythmias uh, including atrial fibrillation and when we have atrial fibrillation, the atria are not contracting properly, then that is a, a potential site for the formation of thrombi. So that is another complication. And also the dilated atria will compress the esophagus that is right behind it. And that can also cause dysphagia, that is problem in um, swallowing. So that is all about mitral valve diseases. So now that we are done with different types of valvular diseases, we're now going to see the different types of heart murmurs uh, that are heard in these valvular dysfunctions. So we know that we have two heart sounds, S1 and S2. S1 occurs when mitral and tricuspid valve closes, while S2 occurs when aortic and pulmonary valve closes. So um, 
between S1 and S2 we're going to have systole and between S2 and the next S1 we're going to have diastole. So as I said before that murmurs are whooshing sounds that are produced by turbulent blood flow. So turbulent blood flow will occur only when we have some valve problem. Now in order to diagnose a murmur we, we need to define a few things that is if it occurs during systole or diastole that is the time when they occur secondly the shape of the wave or the sound or in changes in intensity and lastly the sites at which these are best auscultated first of all let's see systolic murmurs so the first murmur is the systolic ejection murmur as it is a systolic murmur it occurs during systole that is between s1 and s2 so this occurs physiologically as well as in aortic or pulmonary stenosis. So, so what happens during aortic or pulmonary stenosis is that when blood is being pushed out from the narrow stenosed uh, valve what happens is that so firstly we are going to start low and as the ventricle reaches its full contraction we are going to reach the peak and then towards the end of the systole that is going to go down again so this murmur is going to look like this it is actually a wave so this looks like this so it is a diamond so this is called a diamond shaped or a crescendo decrescendo murmur so if that's clear this also uh, can occur physiologically because of course the ventricle has to start somewhere and it has to start contracting and then reach a peak when it has the full contraction and then come back so this will occur either physiologically or during aortic or pulmonary stenosis. This type of murmur is usually preceded by a systolic click. This click occurs when the valve, the stenosed valve snaps open uh, before this murmur. The aortic stenosis murmur is best heard at the aortic area and it radiates towards the neck while the pulmonic stenosis a uh, murmur is best heard at the pulmonic area. Secondly, we have a pan-systolic or a holosystolic murmur. This means that this murmur is going to occur throughout systole. This occurs due to mitral regurgitation or and uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So in this case, this is going to this is not going to peak like this one did because this is simple regurgitation of blood, and this will uh, occur throughout systole. The mitral regurgitation uh, murmur is heard best at the mitral region at where the apex of the heart is, and it radiates towards the uh, left axilla while the tricuspid regurgitation is he heard be best at the uh, tricuspid area and it radiates up towards the left sternal border. Uh, lastly we have the systolic click and late systolic murmur. Now in this case the systolic click is heard because um, during the ventricular contraction there will be a time mostly when the uh, mostly in the middle right in the middle when the ventricle contracts to its maximum and that's when the mitral valve will prolapse into the left atrium right so this is where we'll hear the systolic click and then we can hear uh, the late systolic murmur after that Now coming to diastolic murmurs, we have early diastolic, mid diastolic and opening snap plus diastolic rumble. So early diastolic uh, murmur is heard in aortic regurgitation. So this is very um, easy to understand that after systole ends uh, here, what will happen is that uh, the blood will start to regurgitate back into the left ventricle and that will cause a murmur uh, which which is going to be loudest when the blood is uh, the blood returning back is more that is that will be just at the um, end of systole and then uh, decrease in uh, intensity this is best heard along the left aortic border this is going to peak at the beginning when the difference in pressure is the highest that is between the aorta and the left ventricle but as the pressure uh, goes down and becomes equal this will go down in intensity this is also uh, the same murmur that is heard in pulmonic regurgitation then we have the mid diastolic murmur that is heard in mitral and tricuspid stenosis 
that this occurs because uh, if mitral and tricuspid valves are stenosed the atria will not be able to pump blood into the ventricles during diastole and this is where the murmur will be heard and lastly we have the opening snap and the diastolic rumble this occurs in mitral valve stenosis similarly to this uh, this snap is usually heard in stenosis uh, in any sort of stenosis actually but in this case uh, mitral valve stenosis because if uh, if there is a snap that means that the heart uh, chamber any chamber in this case the atria uh, atrium left atrium is trying very hard to push uh, to push open the valve and when the valve opens it produces this snap this loud snap and then diastolic rumble will continue now this can either be of this shape or if the uh, valve is greatly stenosed then we we will get a snap first and then uh, this sort of wave uh, i hope this made sense and this is the end of a very long uh, lecture but that is it thank you